The Prosecutor's Podcast is brought to you by Progressive. Progressive helps you compare direct auto rates from a variety of companies so you can find a great one, even if it's not with them. Quote today at Progressive.com to find a rate that works with your budget. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Comparison rates not available in all states or situations. John Bellatieri was 26 years old when he was murdered. I do know that John did get into Angel Dust, and I do believe that this was a drug-related murder. Whoever did this is a son of a bitch. My mother is ill, and I would love for her to have some answers before she passes. Real families, real stories. From Lasting Media, I'm Jason B. Jones, and this is Season 2 of Knock Knock, the unsolved murder of John Bellatieri. Listen to Knock Knock now on Podcast One or wherever you listen to podcasts. I'm Brett. And I'm Alice. And we are the Prosecutors. Today on The Prosecutors, we continue our look at the mysterious death of Ellen Greenberg. and welcome to this episode of The Prosecutors. I'm Brett, and I'm joined, as always, by my divine co-host, Alice. Divine! Oh, that's so yeah. nice. I can't... That, good that like, literally made me smile, and I wasn't expecting it. You know, you hear that a lot of... Janie. Janie wow. thinks you're divine, apparently. Janie! That was so kind. I, I really would never have that. called you divine, but I know okay. you better. Okay, I know, Janie I know. Does. Thanks for <laughs> knocking me down a bit. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Brett's just, you know, raining on my parade because he called me, and I waited a while to call him back because I had to finish eating my delicious ice cream bar. <laughs> and That's he's true. like, I'm not as important as your ice cream bar. The answer is no. That's true. Yeah, well, I mean, I respect that. I don't know what you're talking about. I totally respect that. But I love ice cream bars. I love ice cream a lot. Any kind of ice cream. I'm a really big fan. If I said this before, you know, we've been doing this so long, I feel like I'm repeating myself. <laughs> oh, shoot. What's it called? It's the Ben and Jerry's that has the... Don't you like the half-baked? Because half-baked. Which is so That's funny is. as a prosecutor. Your favorite is half-baked. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, I just love... I mean, look, I could eat cookie dough. Just all. I don't need cookies. I don't know why people make cookies. <laughs> just make the cookie dough and eat the cookie dough. It's so much better. My favorite, hands down, because I am a Texan, is Bluebell ice cream. Well, Bluebell is fantastic. Bluebell is phenomenal. And when it reached other states, I got even more excited because I was no longer in Texas and people didn't understand why I was jumping up and down in the aisles that Bluebell was there. I mean, I'll just say, I don't even branch past vanilla with Bluebell because their homemade vanilla ice cream is so good. Mm-hmm. Like, why even why even waste your time with anything else? Oh, their Dutch chocolate. Mm. Uh, I don't know. Maybe I'm going to stop recording to go pick up some ice cream. This is, <laughs> this is very tempting. But... Maybe tomorrow at work we should go get ice cream. <laughs> Let's do it. Let's do it. I like the way you think. Well, actually, do you want to go try out the new boba tea place? I didn't Did know there you get was my text? Boba tea I, place. I texted you guys, or maybe it didn't Did go you? through. Yeah, I texted maybe you. There's a new, it's literally called Tea Room, and it's a new boba place mm-hmm. in town, and they have like pork buns and stuff. So maybe we'll go wow. get some bubble tea and pork buns and be hip. I certainly didn't get this. I don't know. Okay. My phone's been acting weird on the text. I'm not getting texts. Like I should. Maybe I only texted your wife. <laughs> yeah, maybe you did because you didn't text me. It's I think very that's what possible I only I texted Mrs. Brett. <laughs> well, I'm fine. We're going. Is that like, that's like the tapioca balls in the tube? Yes. Tea? Yes. Yeah. It's delicious. It's not healthy, yeah. but it's delicious. Yeah. Okay. It's, right. it's a date. We're doing Woo-hoo. it. Woohoo. Woohoo. Okay. Well, you guys did not come here to talk about boba tea. I'm sure, though, this has been a fascinating conversation. I don't know why you didn't come here to talk about boba tea. We just did free advertising for a tea room in a city you don't know about. (laughs) that You don't even know about. (laughs) So there you go. Maybe we'll run into you at the boba tea room. We'll be there tomorrow. We'll be there tomorrow. Yeah. You'll hear this 
four weeks after that. But it's fine. <laughs> it's fine. But see, this is the thing. Once we, we're on the third episode of this, so you guys have been sucked in. You have to listen to this episode. So we can just ramble as long as we want in the beginning. And you're getting angry. I can tell. You're like, get to the point. Somebody's like, ah. <laughs> Someone on YouTube is going to say, the real conversation starts at 5.07 or whatever it is people do. Anyway, I'm not, I'm not, oh I'm not bitter. I'm not bitter. Anyway. <laughs> Okay, but seriously, this is, I know you guys are excited to hear some more about this case. It's a crazy case, it's a tragic case, it's a weird case, it's a mysterious case, and it's one that there's a lot of things going on right now, and we are just barely scratching the surface of some of the stuff we need to talk about in this case. We've talked about the wounds, I'm sure a lot of you have tried to to recreate those and have had a difficult time. We talked about the fruit. Alice and I, before we started recording today, we were talking about the fruit some more because the fruit is so amazing and crazy. Hannah, who does our artwork, check her out on Instagram at Sirius Moonlight. When she did the artwork, she picked the fruit because as she always does, she manages to cut through to the most important thing in all the cases, it's amazing. And the fruit is just the idea that this woman was peeling an orange and washing some blueberries and then the next moment is stabbing herself in the back of the neck seems a little insane but we talked about that last time i don't want to dwell on it now we're going to get into some more things and eventually we're going to listen to the 911 call in this case and spend a lot of time on that we also the great thing about this podcast is we're getting more and more listeners with more and more expertise we had someone who was a 911 operator or is a 911 operator who listened to the 911 call for us and had some really interesting insights that we're going to share with you as well. But before we get to that, before we get to the 911 call, let's talk about who did Sam call first and when did he call them? When the police arrived on the scene, they were not the first person connected to Sam who was there. Some people have said that his uncle, an attorney named James Schwartzman, was also present. That is a little unclear. I'm not willing to say that 100% that he was there. But based on video footage, it seems like his son and Sam's cousin and good friend, Camion Schwartzman, was definitely there. And as we talked about when we went through the timeline, it appears that Schwartzman arrived on the scene at about 634. That is before the paramedics arrive, and it's only one minute after Sam calls 911 at 633. And as a matter of fact, it appears based on Gavin Fish's reporting, which is based on confidential sources, so take it with a grain of salt, that Camion Schwartzman was the first person that Sam called, and he called him at 614, which is apparently... 15 minutes before he even found Ellen's body. When we talked about the timeline, we talked about how important this seemed to be and how it seems to undermine a lot of the story we're being told. The story we're being told is everything's fine. Sam goes down to work out. He comes back up. The door's locked. He's sending texts. He's getting angry, whatever. He breaks the door down after talking to the doorman, and there's Ellen. He calls 911 there is something missing from this story. And I think the fact of these calls tell you that. It appears that for some reason, Sam thought it was important to call his cousin. And he thought it was so important, he either asked his cousin to come over or his cousin on his own decided to come over. And then his cousin did something else. It is often reported that Sam called his uncle, James Schwartzman, who is a lawyer, but at least according to Gavin Fish's reporting, it was James who called Sam, which means whatever he told Camion was serious enough. Either Sam asked him to get in touch with James, or once again, on his own, Camion called his father and had him call Sam. Now, who is this James Schwartzman guy? He's something of a player in Pennsylvania legal circles. He served on lots of committees that govern the practice of law and judicial ethics in the state. And I can tell you that's an impressive thing. You don't just serve on bar committees and committees about judicial ethics and reviewing judges because a lot of states, what happens to a judge when they misbehave? Most states have committees made up of lawyers, former judges, defense attorneys, prosecutors who oversee judges conduct and can actually remove judges from the bench so as you can imagine these are really important positions and you don't just get them if you're just some random 
person. So this guy's a big deal. He shows up. It makes you think that Sam, for some reason, before he'd even broken down that door, felt like he needed some sort of legal representation. The fact, and I just want to say this, the fact that he called his uncle at some point to me is not strange. If you walk in and you find your fiance on the floor dead and then the paramedics show up and you find a knife in her chest and the police are coming, call a lawyer. I don't care how innocent you are and the more innocent you are, the more you should call a lawyer. And if you have a lawyer in the family, all the better. That is not something that I find unusual. People like to focus on those things. I will never blame you for calling a lawyer. It's the timing of all this. It's the fact that Sam seems to have reached out to these people before, according to the official timeline, he even knew that anything had happened to Ellen. And that tells me there's a part of the story, whatever it is, that we are not being told. Yeah, absolutely, Brett. It's not the calling of his family member who's a lawyer that's suspicious. Absolutely the timing. Because remember, if we are to buy his story from his perspective before he breaks down that door, he has no idea what awaits him on the other side of the door. All he knows is that the door has been locked for about an hour and he can't get in. That can happen. And the first thing you would think of may not necessarily be something that would be incriminating on yourself. So with that said, we've been talking about this door. Sam says that he broke down the door, but here is the interesting part. Sam was alone when he broke down the door. So we have no one to verify that he in fact broke down the door. There are security cameras downstairs where the doorman is, but there are not security cameras upstairs in the hallway where you enter the apartment. So this was not the information that was originally told the police and the medical examiner, both of whom believed and in fact wrote in reports that the doorman was with Sam when he broke down the door. This was not true. The doorman was downstairs. Sam was alone. Therefore, the only way the medical examiner and the police would have known that the door was broken down is by Sam telling them this. There was no other person with him, no one who could verify that he needed to break down the door in order to get in. In fact, I don't think there's another person who can verify that the door was latched in the way that Sam claimed it was latched with kind of the bar across like you see in hotel rooms. That also comes from Sam. Because remember, he tries to get the doorman to help him break down the door. And the doorman says, I can't do that. That's not in my job description. You can imagine, I'm sure that it would get him in a lot of trouble with his job to, you know, ruin property, even if the owner of the apartment asked him to do that. Now, it is interesting that he asked the doorman to help him break down the door because the reason I say that one of the theories, and we're about to talk about the damage to the door, but one of the theories is the door wasn't really locked. The damage was done some other way. This whole breaking down the door story is a myth. That's one of the theories. But what is absolutely true is at some point, Sam did ask the doorman to help him break down the door. If the door wasn't actually locked, that's actually kind of dangerous. Now, maybe Sam knew the policy of the building, but you wouldn't know beforehand, before you asked the doorman, what he's going to say, regardless of the policy. Maybe the doorman's like, yeah, man, I'll do you a favor. Just don't tell anybody. I'll come help you. Well, what if the door's not actually locked and this is just part of your elaborate plan to make this look like a suicide? What do you do then? Like, oh, no, no, never mind. Never mind. I'll handle it myself. The fact that he asked the doorman makes you think that's a check in the favor of his story about being locked out is true because otherwise he is taking a chance there about what the doorman's going to say. A lot has been made of the fact that the doorman wasn't there because that is an inaccuracy or an inconsistency. Depending on which side of this you fall, you'll hear people say that Sam lied to the police, that the doorman was with him. And that was the only reason the coroner said it was a suicide. It is certainly true that the fact the doorman was supposedly with him factored into the coroner's decision because when they heard that they thought okay that confirms the door was actually locked from the inside and had to be broken down that makes it much more difficult to believe this was a murder given everything else so that did have a big effect on the coroner and when the coroner found out that wasn't true that was one of the reasons they went from possible suicide to murder then eventually they ended up at suicide again but the initial shift on that first day from what they were hearing in the beginning, one of the reasons was the doorman wasn't actually there. 
But one thing I want to caution people on, as we said before, it's really important that police take accurate notes and that their report reflects reality. But that doesn't mean they don't mess things up, get things wrong, and transpose things. And a statement to the police like, I asked the doorman to help me break down the door. He said he couldn't help me, so I did it myself. You know, if you're telling the story very quickly, you're going through it very quickly, you could imagine a police officer who's taking notes in his little notebook that he's then going to shift over to a report later. You could imagine him messing that up, hearing, I asked the doorman to help me break down the door, but missing the fact that the doorman said he wouldn't do it. Particularly given, we don't know exactly how Sam might have delivered that information. He might not have gone into much detail about the denial and that he did it himself. So you could imagine a police officer missing that and being a totally innocent thing. So the fact of this conflicting report, it's possible that it goes to Sam's truthfulness, but I think people should be, should be careful about jumping to that conclusion just because of that inconsistency. I think that's a really great point, Brett. It's just a note. That's where we are. But then let's look at the door because that's, that's really interesting. And you guys should take a look at a picture of this latched door and whether it was broken into. Yeah. So we've got the picture up on the website. If you're watching on YouTube, you have the benefit of seeing it live. And look, the door is damaged. Barely. It is really hard. Like, like barely, barely, Brett. Barely, barely. Like barely, barely. Honestly, it looks like my kid ran into it. You know, like my toddler ran into it. That's the amount of damage it looks. So it's definitely damaged. Like you're going to get charged when you move out, you know, if you're renting. Yeah. Honestly, Alice, if you took a screwdriver, if you're looking at this right now, and if you're not, just trying to imagine this. Let me, let me describe it to you as best I can, and then we'll get back to it. Now, we've described this bar latch for you before. You've probably seen them in hotels. If you haven't looked at a picture of this yet and you still have no idea, I don't know that we can describe it much better than we have before, but the bar part is on the door. The latch part is on the door jam. So the bar that is attached to the door is damaged, but as Alice said, only very slightly. Essentially, it looks like it is sort of bent up with the bar going towards the door jam with the screws that hold it in are partially out. So they're not even fully out. And some of the paint and the wood that's sort of attached around it is kind of chipped up a little bit too. Now, as Alice was saying, yeah, you'd probably had to pay for this when you moved out, but honestly, it looks like if you took a screwdriver and, and forced it back into its original position and screwed the screws in again, I'm not even sure you could tell. You might be able to see a little bit of cracking of paint on the door, but I'm not even sure you could tell that this had been done. This is very, very minor damage. It's not the kind of damage you think of when you think of breaking down a door. When you hear that, you know, you're thinking much more dramatic than what we are seeing here. We've mentioned Gavin Fish several times. He has a lot of videos on this. A lot of really good stuff. If you become fascinated with this case, we talked about with Casey Anthony, Crime Weekly was a great place to go if you became obsessed because they had so much information. If you're really interested in this, go to Gavin Fish's YouTube channel, watch some of his videos. One of the things he does is he installs a bar latch like this on a door in his house, and then he breaks down the door to see what would happen. Obviously not a purely scientific demonstration, but it gives you some idea. And when he does it, it's much more like what you would expect happens. The door jam gets all broken, like there's some wood comes off. I mean, it's a much more sort of dramatic damage than what you see here. So there's a couple problems with this. I mean, the first is even assuming it's impossible to lock this door this way from the outside, which by the way, it's not, you can totally do that. You can totally lock one of these doors from the outside if, if you wanted to. You know, there's ways to do it. You can watch YouTube video on it. It's just not that hard. This is not high tech security here. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, it's not like if the deadbolt was locked, you either need a key or you did it from the inside. This is something you probably could do and just make it look like it had been locked by somebody from the inside. But just assume for a second that that's not true. The problem when you look at this is there's really no way to tell whether it's consistent with breaking in the door. It's equally consistent with taking a screwdriver and just sticking it in here and leveraging it out. I mean, the damage is so minor. And 
the other way you could do this, which actually I feel like would be more likely to create this level of damage, is to be on the inside, lock the door, and then just jerk the door towards you. You know, just using the force to jerk the door towards you until, maybe even do it a couple times, until you pull the lock out like this. I could see that. The problem here is we're told that this person has decided to break down the door, and, and you can imagine that that means they're going to put their shoulder into it. They're going to apply some force. I mean, they've decided they're getting in that room. And this level of damage just doesn't seem to be consistent with that at all. Yeah, I mean, what I think of when you put your entire shoulder into the door is that I would think the entire latch that is attached to the door, so like the part that is damaged in this picture, would fall off the wall completely because it's like torn out of the studs that it's screwed into. But instead, it's almost like it's a peeled back sticker. It almost seems like it'd be difficult to limit the amount of damage that we are seeing here if you are putting your entire shoulder into it. But I can imagine, like you said, pulling from the inside, jerking your hand towards yourself while you're still inside to kind of create this ripping almost of the wall paint and the screws from the side. But I'm imagining if it were still latched with the amount of damage, I'm not sure it would still necessarily open because it's really not even hanging off the wall. I think there may even still be enough to keep the door somewhat latched that you would then hit it again and then the whole thing would fall down onto the floor. That's what I would expect if you are putting your entire shoulder into it to break down the door. Now, obviously this is really important because if this is faked, then Sam's got a lot of explaining to do. If it's not faked, it's not necessarily definitive of anything because as we said, even though we're assuming for the sake of argument that it's impossible to lock it from the outside, it's not. So if you were trying to fake a suicide, one way to do it is to make it seem like the door is locked. And this is the minimal amount of lockage you could possibly have, right? It's just this little latch over this bar and that's all you've got. But as Alice said, if this door was broken down, then it was like a precision, a scientific breaking down. That's almost impressive. Like you broke it down with the exact amount of force necessary to break the door down, but no more because you did the minimal possible damage you could do to a door when breaking it down. And I know some of y'all think we're, we're harping on this or, you know, how can you tell from looking at the door when somebody broke it down or not? And that's true. I'm not denying that. This is not scientific. I don't think you look at this picture and know for sure that it wasn't broken down. But go look at the picture and tell me what you think. Look at this picture, and if this picture, if you're like, yeah, obviously, that clearly is a broken in door. Clearly, this is a suicide. Okay, that's fine. And, you know, everybody's entitled to their opinion. To me, what this picture doesn't tell me definitively is that Sam broke down the door. I cannot look at this picture and think, well, there you go. That's proof. Clearly, he broke down the door. I don't see that at all. And just the absolute lack of any damage to the swing bar and the very minimal damage to the bar itself, it's just, it's striking. It will be striking to you when you see this picture. But if this is faked, it worked because the police totally fell for this. When the police looked at it, those of you who see a broken down door, they saw the same thing. And in the official report, the door is described as follows. The inside lock to the front door, a common latch solid bar door guard, is broken with the screws on the door loose, obviously forced in when in a locked position. So the police think this is obvious. Now, here's the thing. I think there's a lot of confirmation bias going on with the police here. I think the police showed up at the scene looked at the scene and very quickly reached a conclusion about what they thought happened. That is not uncommon. In fact, it's very common. Police are highly trained. They've experienced a lot of scenes. It is very common for them to very quickly look at a scene, analyze the situation and sort of realize what's going on here. You know, realize when the boyfriend over there crying on the couch killed the person. They're very good at that. And 99% of the time, maybe not 99%, but a lot of times it turns out to be true. One thing the police have to be very careful about, though, is while that is important, what their first thoughts are, and they need to go with that, and they need to investigate that, it should not close off other avenues of investigation. they got to keep an open mind so they can narrow things, and a lot of times they'll end up where they began. And in this case, it's pretty clear the police showed up. They saw 
not a lot of blood, a knife in someone's heart, no evidence of a struggle, a door with a little bit of damage on it, and they very quickly are like suicide. They didn't know a lot of the things we've talked about. You know, they didn't know about all the stab wounds in the back of her neck. That sort of weirdness. All they saw was very basic things. Yeah, and remember, Brett, you know, we're not saying that the police were lazy or they necessarily, you know, were in the pocket of anyone and they wanted to conclude this was a suicide because everything that was set up for them to come into was pointing them towards a not Sam, basically, right? From Sam's 911 call, which we're about to get to, he starts laying the foundation that the door is locked, that he was just downstairs and he's been, you know, trying to reach his girlfriend and he can't reach her. And again, the door is locked. I don't know what's going on. Right. And all of this is leading in his confusion about why she's on the floor. Did she fall? Did she, you know, he is not raising any alarms on the phone like, oh, my goodness, she's been stabbed. The very first thing is it's like an accident. She must have fallen and oh, she stabbed herself. Oh, she fell. None of it points to any alarm that someone has done this to her. And they get a lot of these cues from the 911 calls in how people react, right? When you call in a missing child, if you are calling just that they're missing because you think they wandered off, there's a gate open, no one was paying attention, you think the child has wandered off versus if you call and say, there's a missing child, we have reason to believe that a father who doesn't have custody over her has left with her and we saw his car come by. They're gonna treat those situations differently coming in because they have to gather information as they're coming in to try and respond as quickly as possible. So know that they're already walking into kind of a preset situation set by the 911 call, set by the scene, set by things they're being told as they're walking into the scene before they can even interpret what they are seeing with their own eyes. So Alice mentioned the 911 call. Let's go ahead and listen to it. Once again, Gavin Fish has this. It's on his YouTube channel. It took a while to get the 911 call. If you listen to a lot of coverage of this case, they'll say the 911 call hasn't been released, but they'll comment on what other people have said about it. Well, now we have it. So you're going to get to hear it. We're going to play the whole thing. And then we're going to walk through some of the interesting stuff that's in the 911 call. So here we go. The 911 call that Sam made that night. Help, I, 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 need, I need a murder. Now, I just, I just walked to my apartment. My fiance is on the floor with blood everywhere. What is the address? 4601 Flat Rock Road. Please come. Help. 40 now. 401 Flat, Flat Rock Road. Is this a house or apartment? Oh, oh no. Oh, no. It's an apartment. It's an apartment. What apartment number? <laughs> Please hurry, Where please. Is she bleeding from? She, I don't know. I can't tell. She's... No. So you have to calm yourself down in order to get you some help. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. She. Okay. I don't know. I, I'm looking at her right now. She. I don't. I can't see anything. She didn't, there's nothing broken. She's bleeding. Ellie. You don't know where she's bleeding from, can you? Ellie, where blood's coming from? It's, I think her head. I think she hit her head, I think. I think but it's, all, it's everywhere. Okay, sir, it's so everywhere. She, she might have fallen. Do you know yeah. what happened? I, she, she, she may have slipped. There's blood on the on the table. Her, her face is a little purple. Okay, hold on for rescue for her. Stay on the phone. Department 842, what's the address? No, uh, 4601 Flat Rock Road, please hurry. 4601 Flat Rock? Yes. What's wrong? My, my, I just, my, I went downstairs to go work out. I came back up, the door was latched. My fiance's inside, she wasn't, she wasn't answering, so after about a half hour, I decided to break it down. I see her now just on the floor with blood. She's not, she's not responding. Okay, is she breathing? She, I, <laughs> Look at her chest. I need you to calm down, and I need you to look at her chest. It's really. I don't think she. I really don't think she is. Listen to me. Someone's on the way. Look at her chest. Is she flat on her back? <laughs> She's on her back. So okay, I her... Look at her chest and tell me if it's going up and down, up and down. I don't see her moving. Okay. Do you know how to do CPR? I don't. Okay. I can tell you what to do. Okay. Until they get there, I want you to keep her. Oh on her God. Back. Hello. Yeah, hi, okay. Are you willing to do CPR with me over the phone so they can I, get, I, I have to, right? Okay, so get her flat on her back, bare her chest, okay? You want to rip her shirt off. Okay, you need to kneel down by her side. Oh, my God. Allie, please. Listen, listen, you can't freak out, sir, because you Okay, I'm trying not to. I'm trying not to. Her shirt won't come off. It's a zipper. Rip oh, my off. God, she stabbed herself. Where? 
She fell on a knife. Oh, no, her knife's sticking out. Oh, uh, what? There's a knife sticking out of her heart. Oh, she stabbed herself? I, can't, I guess so. I don't know where she fell on it. I don't know. Okay, well, don't touch it. Okay, Please. so I'll just, I'll just let her down. Here now, I mean, what do I do? No, uh, I mean, you can't. If the knife is at her chest, it's going to be kind of hard for you to do CPR at this time. Oh, no. Oh, my goodness. Okay. Police, which operator? 277. Is All someone right, coming here? Yes, they are. You said 4601 Flat Rock, right? Yes. Okay, someone's on the way. And the knife is still inside? Which or what? The knife is still inside of her? Yes, I didn't take it out. Was it her chest or what area? It's, it's, it's in her chest. It's it's like, it looks like it's right. It looks like it's right in her heart. Okay, someone's on the way out there, okay? Just get oh, my God. Oh, my God. Okay. How old is she? She's 27. 27. And there's no sign of life at all? I no, to her no, arm. no, please don't be. What? Been trying to her arm and tell me she responds to pain. She's... Ellie, she's not, she's not, her arm, her hands are still warm. I don't know if that means, but there's blood every, I mean. I know, but you can't, and the knife is still inside of her. How far? Can you see how far it went in? It looks pretty deep. Okay. It looks three, and it's a long knife. Don't touch anything. Yeah, don't yeah. touch anything, okay? I'm not touching anything. This is, I can't believe this, though. No, wait, it was just you there with her? We, yeah, we're the only ones here. And she ran in the door, you said, latched it shut? No, no, I, I, I went downstairs to work out, mm -hmm. and I, when I came back up, the door was latched. Oh. Like, it was, you know, it wasn't like, it was, you know, it was like locked from the inside, and I'm yelling, and I saw it was, so I'm, well, you know, yelling. Was your house broken yelling. into? No, 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 no. So there's no sign of a break-in? No, no sign of a break-in at all. I mean, there will be when you get here, because I had to break the latch, but... To get in. Okay, 4601 Flat Rock, and this is a house, right? It's an apartment. Flat Rock apartment. Okay, that'll help. Oh my god, oh my god. All right, thank okay. you. Mm -hmm. Bye. The Prosecutor's Podcast is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Let's face it, sometimes multitasking can be overwhelming. Like when your favorite podcast is playing and the person next to you is talking and your car fan is blasting all while you're trying to find the perfect parking spot. But then again, sometimes multitasking is easy, like quoting with Progressive Insurance. They do the hard work of comparing rates so you can find a great rate that works for you, even if it's not with them. Give their nifty comparison tool a try, and you might just find getting the rate and coverage you deserve is easy. All you need to do is visit Progressive's website to get a quote with all the coverages you want, like comprehensive and collision coverage or personal injury protection. Then you'll see Progressive's direct rate, and their tool will provide options from other companies all lined up and ready to compare, so it's simple to choose the rate and coverages you like. Press play on comparing auto rates. Quote at Progressive.com to join the over 27 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Comparison rates not available in all states or situations. Prices vary based on how you buy. Alice, today I'm excited to talk about one of my favorite games, June's Journey. It combines two things that I love, true crime and gaming. And let me tell you, June's Journey is basically a threat to this podcast because I play it so much that I'm kind of slacking. It's a good thing we've got someone who's doing our editing because between June's Journey and my job, I don't have as much time for the podcast as I used to have. But you guys can join us and we can play together. We have a detective league. Join our detective league and you can help test your skills against some of the best players on June's journey with us. It's so true, Brett. It's so addicting. I pull it out if I'm waiting in line to pick up my kids or at the store or just have a free minute because it's so engaging and it's easy to play. So whether you're craving a good mystery or just need to get away for a while, June's Journey is the perfect game for you. You'll search for hidden clues to solve mystery after mystery across thousands of vivid scenes. And with new chapters every week, there's always a new case waiting to be cracked. June's Journey has tons of fun and unique features to keep you entertained. If you do join our detective club, you get to chat and play with us or against us, and it really puts your skills to the test. So find your inner detective. Download June's Journey today. Available on Android and iOS mobile devices, as well as on PC through Facebook games. Now a word from our sponsor, BetterHelp. Brett, 
Let's talk about the reality of carrying stresses, stresses from home, stresses from work, stresses from life. There are times when I feel like I'm juggling everything and the weight of the world is on my shoulders. And it can be tough to train my brain to stay in problem solving mode when I'm faced with these challenges. But I'm so excited about our sponsor, BetterHelp, because they make a therapist available for you to help you become a better problem solver, make it easier to accomplish your goals, no matter how big or small. So if you're thinking of giving therapy a try, BetterHelp is a great option because it's convenient, accessible, affordable, entirely online. You get matched with a therapist after filling out a brief survey and you can switch therapists anytime. Yeah, Alice, you talk about stressors, and there are so many out there these days, whether it's what's going on in the world or if it's hitting closer to home with costs going up and it just being harder to make ends meet. There's a lot of things that are stressing people, and therapy can help. And we hope that you guys will check out BetterHelp. When you want to be a better problem solver, therapy can get you there. Visit BetterHelp.com slash prosecutors today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash prosecutors. Alice, summer isn't over yet, and whether you're spending long sunny days by the pool or exploring new places on vacation, there is a universal urge to make the most out of what summer we have left, and that's where Faraday comes in. They provide high-quality clothing that's incredibly soft and comfortable, always sustainably minded and meant to be worn from surf to city. Alice, I recently had a business trip where I had to go to the beach and Faraday was perfect. I could wear the Faraday shirts to the cocktail hours and the business meetings, or I could wear them on the beach and they were perfect in both places. Faraday clothes are thoughtfully crafted with a classic style and you will wear them over and over again. It's so true, Brett. My Haley dress this summer was my go-to outfit. Whether to go to a fancy event, it could be dressed up or down. The best part is it fits so many situations and it's so well crafted and comfortable. Faraday is so committed to sustainability. They even have a lifetime guarantee of quality. They'll replace or fix your clothes forever, no matter what. So your clothes can last as long as your favorite summertime memories. And that's good for me because I wear it all the time. Right now, Faraday is giving all of our listeners 20% off. Let me say that again, 20% off. Head to FaradayBrand.com slash TP and use code TP at checkout to get this deal. That's code TP at Faraday, F-A-H-E-R-T-Y brand.com slash TP for 20% off. FaradayBrand.com slash TP. Brett, we've got a very different kind of sponsor for this episode, The Jordan Harbinger Show, which is a podcast you really should be listening to. And I know that every day someone tells you that you just have to listen to some podcasts and you nod and say, sure, and then you never listen to it. Don't let that happen here. Jordan's show, which Apple named one of its best of 2018, is aimed at making you a better informed, more critical thinker so you can get a sense of how the world actually works and come to your own conclusions about what's happening even inside your own brain. And if you love true crime, which we certainly do, you can check out Jordan Harbinger's True Crime Starter Pack. You can learn about Billy McFarland, how he went from the Firefest fiasco to federal prison, or about the secret life of an American art forger. Whatever you're looking for, Jordan has a show for you. Alice, we love podcasts that are engaging, that are thoughtful, that make you think. And that is the Jordan Harbinger Show. If that's not worth checking out, I'm not sure what is. We really enjoy this show, and we think you will as well. Search for the Jordan Harbinger Show. That's H-A-R-B as in boy, I-N as in Nancy, G-E-R on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Now, this call that we just played is from Gavin Fish's YouTube channel. He's done a lot of stuff on this case that we've already mentioned in previous episodes. So if you're fascinated by it, go check out his YouTube page. There's some great information there. But here, let's walk through the transcript of the call. Even though you heard kind of his tone, his intonation, the way he breathes, how fast he's talking, it's helpful to break down the actual words that he's saying on this 911 call. 
Sam starts, help, I need a, I just, I just walked to my apartment. My fiance is on the floor with blood everywhere. 911 says, what is the address? Sam responds, 4601 Flat Rock Road, please come help now. 911 says, is this a house or apartment? Sam responds, oh no, oh no, it's an apartment. 911, what apartment number, please? Sam says, hurry, please. 911 says, where is she bleeding from? Sam says, I don't know. I can't tell. She's, no. 911 says, sir, you have to calm down in order to get you some help. And Sam responds, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. She, I don't know. I'm looking at her right now. She, I don't, I can't see anything. She doesn't, there's nothing broken. She's bleed. Ellie. Okay, let me stop there for a second. Imagine all of this, everything you just heard me say. Imagine the scene. Sam presumably had no idea what was happening, was angry, has texts to show that he's getting angry and that she won't open the door, forces his way into the apartment and sees blood everywhere and Ellen slumped over on the floor. Presumably, he has not touched her yet, and he's just in shock as he calls 911. And I think it's really interesting that he mentions the blood, and then he says, nothing's broken. That's just a very interesting thing to say when he hasn't inspected her. Remember, he hasn't mentioned a knife that's sticking out of her. All he sees is blood, and he says, nothing's broken. That's just a very interesting assessment of the situation. And we always caution people not to put too much stock into 911 calls, but like so many of the things we say about behavior, that has to have a caveat. When we say that, we really mean the way they're acting, if they're too hysterical, if they're not hysterical enough. We talked about this in the Ramsey case, and we talked about this in the Peterson case. We talked about why people miss things and why people get upset with the 911 operator. This 911 call, in so many ways, is very clinical. It's like he's standing there, he's not particularly close to her. Right? Like in the Peterson case, you know, it's pretty clear that if, if Michael Peterson didn't kill her, when he found her, he was like up on her, you know, I mean, he was, he was like, cause he got blood all over himself. And in this case, it's pretty clear that Sam, he didn't get very close to his fiance. Like he sees her. If, if what he is saying is true, he comes in, he sees her. And he actually does a pretty good job of maintaining the scene. Like he doesn't get in close. It's like he's standing from a distance describing what he's seeing to this 911 operator in a way that to me is a little strange. Now, one thing I'll say, there's not as much blood in this scene as you would expect. It's not obvious where all she's bleeding from. So it's not that strange that he doesn't know that yet, but it is certainly the case that he is looking at her body and has not yet seen the knife sticking out of her chest. So we'll, we'll keep going. 911 says, you don't know where she's bleeding from? Sam says, Ellie, it's, I think her head. I think she hit her head. I think, but there's blood everywhere. It's everywhere. 911 says, do you think she might have fallen? Do you know what happened? Sam responds, she, she, she may have slipped. There's blood on the, on the table. Her, her face is a little purple. 911 says, okay, hold on for rescue for her. Stay on the phone. And then this is where she, you hear the dial tone come in. And then Philadelphia Fire Department 842, what's the address? Sam says again, 4601 Flat Rock Road, please hurry, 4601 Flat Rock. 911, yes, what's wrong? Sam responds, my, my, I just, my... I went downstairs, go work out. I came back up. The door was latched. My fiance's inside. She wasn't, she wasn't answering. So after about a half hour, I decided to break it down. I see her now just on the floor with blood. Like she's, she's not responding. Let me stop there for a second. In response to the question, what's wrong? He actually goes all the way back to his workout, which is just interesting because this sets the whole scene. You can imagine if the answer to what's wrong is I walked in and my fiance is bloody 
unresponsive on the floor can sound really bad for you. And if you were kind of looking at it in a cold situation, you might want to say, wait, let me back up. That sounds really bad. Let me tell you the whole situation. I wasn't even around. I had actually gone to work out and I couldn't get back in for half an hour before I decided to break down the door. I can't imagine someone who was like traumatized saying that. But it's just an interesting response to the question, what's wrong? It's not what's wrong in front of you right now to Ellen, your fiance. Rather, it's the entire story of how you came to be from your perspective. Remember, it's not coming from what she's doing. You can imagine another response to the question, what's wrong with respect to Ellen would be, I don't know. We were having a conversation. I left for about an hour. I came back and she had, I knew that she had been on the phone or she came back early from school. Something about Ellen that would help explain why Ellen was in the situation that Sam had found her in. But rather the entire narrative is from Sam's perspective. Discussing these things is always interesting because on the one hand, I sort of have my opinions about 911 calls and what you can take from and what you can't. But one of the things we like to do here is just give you all the information and let you decide. So you can decide what you think about this. Do you think this is significant or not? What some people will say about this is the fact that, remember when we did the Ramsey case? And one of the things we pointed out was every question that Patsy Ramsey was asked, she answered. They asked a question, she gave the answer to it. In this case, you have what's wrong and you don't get what's wrong until the last sentence of this answer. You get, he went downstairs. You start off with my, my, I just, my, which is a little strange because he doesn't say my fiance. I mean, he, he that like, really stuck out to me, Brett. It really did. It was almost like he didn't quite know what to call her because maybe they just had a fight. I mean, my fiance should just roll out. And it did at the very beginning of the call. But it's just strange to me that he can't even say what she is. And here's the thing. The one thing I am 100% convinced of in this case is there is something we don't know. There is a secret at the heart of this case. I don't know exactly what that secret is, and I don't know what that secret means, but there is a secret. One possibility is that they just had a massive fight and broken off the engagement. You know, if you think this is suicide, you probably think there's a reason for that, right? Maybe that's what the reason was. And maybe when he's on the 911 call, he can't think of what to call her because he doesn't know what she is anymore, right? And now he doesn't want to say that. He doesn't want to tell us that story because even though he's not guilty of killing her, he feels guilty about what happened before she killed herself, right? I mean, that's a possibility. That may be completely wrong, but it's a possibility. And when you hear something like this, it makes you think that. But just going back to what he says, what's wrong? The answer is, I went downstairs, go work out. I came back up. The door was latched. My fiance's inside. She wasn't answering. So after about a half hour, I decided to break it down. None of that is answering what's wrong. He then says, I see her now just on the floor with blood like she's, she's not responding. Compare that to the Michael Peterson case. And whether this matters might be whether you think Michael Peterson killed his wife or not. But on the 911 call, it's Durham emergency what's wrong and he immediately says my wife's had an accident she's still breathing she fell down the stairs she's still breathing hurry right so he's asked what happened and he immediately tells the 911 operator exactly what happened he didn't say i was down by the pool we were drinking some wine i was hanging out she went back up i came back up i came inside and there she was on the on the floor he didn't say that he answers the question right once again, <laughs> how significant that is may depend on what you think about Michael Peterson. But one thing I think we can say for sure is when he's answered the question, he gives a very long narrative. We'll come back to this because, like I said, we somebody who does this stuff has listened to this and has given their opinion. So you'll be interested to hear what they think. But to me, this is striking. Okay, so it continues. 911 says, okay, is she breathing? Sam responds, she, I, 911, look at her chest. I need you to calm down and I need you to look at her chest. It's really, Sam says, I don't think she, I really don't think she is. 911, listen, listen to me. Someone's on the way. Look at her chest. Is she flat on her back? Sam says, she's on her back. Do I bring her? This is interesting. He's telling us what the position is. Presumably, he has not touched her yet. He walks in presumably with her on her back based on what he's saying in this call. 911, look at her chest and tell me if it's going up and down, 
up and down. Again, if she is flat on her back, it confuses me why he hasn't seen a knife sticking out of her chest because there's no obstruction. And he's staring at her chest to see if she's breathing. He's staring at her chest. I can imagine if she were slumped over against a cabinet as if she were sitting and her head has fallen forward and her chest is collapsed in and her hands are by her legs that you couldn't see the concavity of her chest to be able to see anything sticking out of it but by his own words she's on her back and when you're on your back you're flat especially if you're not responsive you have no ability to prop yourself up or be hunched over because if you're in a fetal position on the side then you'd be on your side not on your back so if you're on your back gravity does its work and you are flat and if you are flat you'd be able to see something sticking out of your chest which spoiler alert despite what he says here is not reality she's not on her back unless he moves her when the police show up, she's exactly how Alice described her, leaning against the cabinet. So what's going on here? I don't know. Yeah. And again, 911 is very clear with him. Look at her chest. Tell me if it's going up and down, up and down. And Sam responds, I don't see her moving. 911 then says, okay, do you know how to do CPR? Sam says, I don't. 911, okay, I can tell you what to do. Okay, until they get there, I want you to keep her. Sam, oh God. 911, hello? Sam responds, yeah, hi, okay. 911 says, are you willing to do CPR with me over the phone until they can? Sam responds, I, I have to, right? Okay, there have been a few weird things in this call so far, but this is, I think, a pretty weird response to are you willing to do CPR? Not asking, can you? We have already established that he doesn't know how to do CPR and 911 says, it's okay, I can walk you through it. And then I thought this was actually a really good, insightful question for the 911 operator to ask. Are you willing, not can you, do CPR? And Sam's response isn't, of course, I'll do anything. Just tell me what to do. Oh my God, I can't believe this is happening. It's, I mean, I have to, right? Which again, seems very self-aware like why why do you have to to save her life if that's the case wouldn't your response be well i have to to save her life right rather than oh i have to get myself dirty i have to touch her blood to do this it just seems like a very strange response that comes from a sam perspective that has nothing to do with ellen or saving ellen and you know sam there's a couple possibilities here most charitable i guess is he has no idea how to do this and is afraid he's going to mess something up. But if he needs to try, he'll try, even if it makes things worse. I mean, I guess that's the most charitable. It's not what it sounds like. Just when you listen to him say it, that's not what it sounds like. The other possibility is Sam's just a really selfish person. He didn't kill her. He didn't have anything to do with her death. But he's just really, as Alice said, he's not really that interested in getting right up on her bloody body and trying to do CPR when he thinks she's already dead. That's a possibility. Least charitable is probably he murdered her and he's afraid if he does CPR, it might work, right? I mean, that would be a concern if you killed somebody and then they're like, can you do CPR? And you're like, I'd rather not. What if it works out, right? I mean, that would be a problem for you. So that's probably your least charitable explanation but hey i mean it's a strange thing now i don't think this is as explainable if you go all the way back to when we did amy bechtel we always talk about this how her husband when he calls her in missing he kind of makes a sort of gallows humor joke about how he's missing somebody and do you have a spare right and people always point to that it's like see he knew she was dead he didn't care to me that is i'm dealing with a highly stressful situation and trying to do the best i can that's not what I see here. This is really strange. And it's just, if it were the only strange thing, maybe you could let it go, but it's not. Okay. Then 911 says, okay, so get her flat on her back, bare her chest, okay? You want to rip her shirt off. Sam responds, ah, shit. 911, okay, feel down by her side. Sam responds, oh my God, Ellie, please. 911 responds, listen, listen, you can't freak out, sir, because you, Sam says, okay, I'm trying not to. Her shirt won't come off. It's a zipper. Okay. He's about to say, oh my God, she stabbed herself. But up until this point, presumably she was on her back, but he straightened her out on the back. 
And in response to 9 one telling him to take off her shirt, he's trying to get the shirt off, but he's somehow trying to get the zipper off and it's hard to. But the knife isn't under the zipper shirt. It's over. She's wearing clothing and has been stabbed through her clothing. She didn't put on a jacket after she finished stabbing herself. So it's unclear what the zipper has anything to do with him being able to see the knife. In any event, this is the point in the call where he presumably sees the knife for the first time. And his response is, she stabbed herself. 911 then says, where? Sam then kind of quickly changes. I mean, she he went from she stabbed herself to she fell on a knife. Oh no, there's a knife sticking out. There's a knife sticking out of her heart. That whole line right there is very specific. In a matter of seconds, he went from she stabbed herself to she fell on a knife. That's fine. You're trying to figure out what's happening. Both of those things are self-inflicted sorts of things. And he comments, oh, no, there's a knife sticking out. Again, kind of strange why the knife is sticking out. He couldn't see it previously when he was looking at her chest when she was flat on her back. And then very specifically, he says, there's a knife sticking out of her heart. And I'm trying to give Sam the benefit of the doubt here. It's a very stressful situation. Assuming everything he said is true. Very stressful situation. Crazy thing to walk into. And maybe, you know, I mean, it's a big knife, but it's a steak knife and most of it is inside of her. So the only the handle is sticking out. I mean, if what he's telling is true, then he just doesn't see the knife for whatever reason. I mean, I don't, I, it's, it's kind of like when you're looking for something and it's right in front of you, it's like sitting on the table, but you're looking for it and you're looking for it and you just don't see it for whatever reason, because your brain is just not processing correctly. And so the thing that you are literally looking for, as my mom would say, if it were a snake, it would have bit you. Is what she would always say when, when you lose something, it's like right there. So maybe it's just, he's not expecting to see it. So he doesn't see it. You know, the brain does weird, crazy things. Alternatively, if he's responsible for this, the psychology would be, you're kind of trying to delay the moment. We talk about this sometimes when you think about why people do things when they do, you know, we'll go back to Michael Peterson. Some people say that he delayed making the phone call. Why would he delay making the phone call? Because he knows once he makes a phone call, it all starts. Once you call 911, there's no more cleaning up. There's no more staging. There's no more prep. It's on now. And the wheels are going to be in motion and there's no turning back. This is maybe sort of a similar thing. He knows as soon as he says there's a knife there, there's no turning back. And so he's sort of delaying and delaying until he can delay no more. The zipper thing is weird because you have to imagine he's like trying to get the zipper down and the knife is right there and he doesn't see it because it's not, as Alice said, that he unzips the jacket, opens it up and there's a knife. That's not what happened. This is very strange and... I don't know. I'm, I'm interested to know what you guys think, but he basically was staring at her chest, didn't see the knife, messing with her shirt, didn't see the knife, then finally sees the knife. And as Alice said, he jumps immediately to she stabbed herself. You actually see this a lot in true crime. I mean, like we've said this before, there's a whole subgenre of is it murder? Is it suicide? And you'll have a lot of 911 calls where people will say things like she stabbed herself or she hung herself or whatever. And one question people ask is, why did you assume it was suicide? You know, why wouldn't you say someone stabbed her here, you know, or she fell in the night? Why wouldn't you start there? Why do you start with a suicide? And people say, well, the, the reason is you're trying to convince the police it was a suicide from the very beginning. And that's why you start off that way. Maybe, I don't know. Maybe it's just a natural reaction. I don't know what I would think. Once again, a lot of this is colored by things we don't know. If they had some huge, massive fight before he went down to the gym, he comes back up, he finds her dead, there's a knife stuck in her chest, he might immediately go to suicide because she might have been super upset when he left her. But they're just pieces of this puzzle that we don't have. Okay, let's get through the rest of this call. So after he says there's a knife sticking out of her, 911 says, oh, she stabbed herself? Sam responds, I guess, I guess so, I don't know, or she fell on it, I don't know. 911 says, okay, well, don't touch it. Sam says, okay, so I'm just, just let her down here now. I mean, what do I do? 911 says, no, I mean, you can't. If the knife's in her chest, it's going to be kind of hard for you to do CPR at this time. Sam, oh no, oh my goodness, okay. 
911. Police, which operator 277? Sam, is someone coming here? 911, yes, they are. You said 4601 Flat Rock, right? Sam, yes. 911, okay, someone's on the way and the knife is still inside. Sam, wait, what? 911, the knife is still inside of her? Sam responds, yes, I didn't take it out. And he laughs. Again, we can't really judge people when they act in hard situations, but it's an interesting response to the knife is still inside of her saying, yeah, I didn't take it out and to laugh. People laugh in all sorts of situations, but he does do that here. Yeah. This struck me when I heard it for the first time. I don't know if it struck anybody else, but I try really hard, like we've said a thousand times, not to judge people based on how they react in difficult situations. It's really hard for me to imagine being in this situation and laughing at any point. So I don't know. There's something so clinical and detached about it. And maybe it was because, as we've said, you know, maybe, like I said, maybe they broke up and he goes to the gym and he's full expectation. He's going to come back up, pack his stuff and leave and never see her again. And he's already sort of disconnected from her. Maybe. But if they are really in a super happy relationship, getting ready to get married and can't wait, I just can't imagine reacting the way he does to this. But whatever. We don't know. And he's his own person. So 911 goes on. Was it a chest or what area is it in the chest, in her chest? Sam, it's like, it looks like it's right. It looks like it's right in her heart. 911. Okay, someone's on the way out there. Okay, just get your Sam. Oh my God. Oh my God. 911. How old is she? Sam responds, she's 27. 911, 27, and there's no sign of life at all. Sam, no, no, no. Please don't be what? 911 tells him, pinch under her arm and tell me if she responds to pain. Sam responds, she's Ellie. She's not. It's not her arm and her hands are still warm. I don't know if that means, but there's blood every, I mean, 911. I know, but you can't and the knife is still inside of her. How far can you see how far it went? Sam responds, it looks pretty deep. It looks three, it's a long knife. 911, don't touch anything. Yeah, don't touch anything. Sam responds, okay, I'm not touching anything. This is, I can't believe this. Ugh. 911, so wait, it was just you there with her? Sam, we, yeah, we're the only ones here. 911, and she ran in the door and latched it shut? Sam, no, no, I, I, I went downstairs to work out and I, when I came back up, the door was latched. Oh, like it was, you know, it wasn't like it, you know, it was like locked from the inside and I'm yelling. 911, was the house broken into? Sam, no, 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 no. Again, very interesting in response to the question, was the house broken into? He immediately denies it. Presumably the first thing he notices when he comes in is Ellen slumped on the floor, bleeding, unresponsive. I would be surprised that he'd notice anything around him at all. So for him to so, so definitively say that the house wasn't broken into, I think is just an interesting choice. 911 then said, there's no sign of a break-in. Sam, no, no sign of a break-in at all. I mean, there will be when you get here because I had to break the latch, but to get in. Again, very interesting, all from his perspective. He's already thinking, like, I would think you'd be in shock here, but he's already saying, well, you might look and see like there's been a break-in, but that's because of a completely reasonable scenario of me having to get in. 911, okay, 4601 Flat Rock, and this is a house, right? Sam, it's an apartment. 911, okay. Sam, oh my God, oh my God, all right, thank you, okay, bye. I will say this. If you're somebody who puts a lot of stock in 911 calls, there's a lot here. And there's a lot of things that you can point to. Sam, his affect is all over the place. And maybe that's how it would be if you were actually in shock. But there are times where he's like yelling her name and he seems very upset. He's saying, oh my God, and all the things you would expect. Then there are times when the 911 operator will ask him a question and all of a sudden all that goes away and he just gets very normal. You know, like when he's talking about the fact that there's no break in, there's no emotion there. You know, when he's laughing about the fact he didn't take the knife out, when he says the whole, I have to, right? When he says that, I mean, there are just times in this call where it's as if he's talking to somebody about, uh, you know, his car getting broken into or, or so, he's just reporting sort of basic facts and there's just, there's just no emotion whatsoever. And that strikes me as strange. 
Alice has pointed this out, and we've talked about it a little bit, but he starts with it's a suicide. He makes it very clear to the operator there wasn't a break in. This wasn't a murder. Don't need to investigate this as a murder. This is clearly either an accident or she, she stabbed herself. And as Alice said, no, no sign of a break in at all. How much time did you spend looking to see whether there was a break in before you called 911? Later on, the police are going to figure out that there are no footprints on the balcony. Nobody, you know, climbed up the six stories or whatever. And But did you go in the bedroom to see whether it was ransacked? Did you see whether anything was stolen? Like, on what basis are you saying there's no sign of a break-in? And then pointing out that anything you do see is just me when I was trying to get in. There's a lot here that is really unusual. And I think probably should have at least raised some questions. I will say this. I think most police officers, if they heard this 911 call, would be immediately suspicious of the fiancé. They might quickly disabuse themselves of those suspicions, but I think when they heard this, they would say, yeah, let's, let's take a little bit more of a look into this person. But one thing I do want to do, as I've been saying, we had someone who, who knows what they're doing, unlike us, Take a look at this call and let us know what they think. Want to thank Alex, who is a 911 dispatcher, who has written in to us. And we said, hey, take a listen to this and tell us what you think. So I'm going to read you her email, which part of it will take issue with some of the things we've said, but I think also makes some interesting points. So judging by what people usually find unusual about 911 calls, I bet people will find it suspicious that he gave all the backstory about going downstairs to work out, coming back upstairs, find the door latched, etc., but that's not unusual. I'll ask for an address and people tell me what they had for breakfast, the color of their cat, etc. before they get to the info I need. Could it be his way of creating an alibi on recording? Maybe, but that alone isn't unusual to me, but I know people tend to jump to conclusions when that happens. But this is suspicious. How was he able to tell the operator if her chest was rising and falling and not see the knife? He said she was flat on her back, sounded like he was watching her chest to see if she was breathing. He says something about a zipper and only then sees a knife sticking out of her heart. I probably would have asked him how he didn't notice it until that moment because that was my first question. How did you miss that? His affectation is a bit odd, too. I've never had someone in that kind of situation react in such a detached way. I know I say behavior and reactions on a 911 call is fairly useless to try to interpret because people respond to emergencies differently, but I do find his response a little unusual. Usually people are more hysterical, but again, his lack of response itself isn't damning, in my opinion. But him claiming she was flat on her back, yet he somehow didn't notice a large knife sticking out of her heart, combined with his flat reaction to suddenly discovering the knife, would have definitely raised an alarm in me had I taken that call. And then she notes that she is unfamiliar with this case, and so this is an unbiased opinion. So I think that's really interesting. I think it tracks some of the things we've said. She doesn't find... The fact that he takes so long to get to the point, unusual, it's probably not unusual. And I agree with her. I think if you take any one thing in isolation, that's probably a mistake. You really should take the call as a whole. And so I would say the fact he does that, combined with the fact he doesn't see the knife, combined with the fact his affectation is so flat, is a little unusual. You know, you can't convict somebody on a 911 call, but I'll tell you what you could do. You could investigate the case more. And... That's really the heart of this. We're talking about this like we're trying to figure out whether or not this was a suicide or a murder. But in reality, the real question is, should the police have investigated more than they did? And as we continue to talk about this case, we're going to see how little they investigated. And just what an absolute travesty it is how little the police did in this case. But that's going to be for next week. This is all we got for this week. Let us know what you think. What do you think about that 911 call? Are we overreacting? Do you think it's actually pretty innocuous? Take a look at that door and let us know what you think about the door. Shoot us an email, prosecutorspod at gmail.com, at prosecutorspod for all your social media. Hello to those of you on YouTube, and thank you to all of you on Patreon who are listening to this episode early and ad-free. You guys, we love you, and thank you for supporting us. And hello to the gallery. I'm sure there's been a lot of discussion on Facebook, on the gallery, and I hope you will join that discussion. Alice, is there anything you want to add before we sign off for today? Whew, that was a lot. <laughs> yeah, you're right. When we started recording at the beginning, I thought we'd get through everything. But of course, this 911 call was just so meaty, I didn't think we needed to rush through it. So I'm glad we're taking the time to go through it. And I think 
there are lots of interpretations here. So I hope you guys will let us know what you think. And I do think we'll finish next week, but we'll see. And then we'll have the whole story, this story that, like I said, is developing and has finally become an active investigation. But that's all we have for today. We will be back next week, I think, to wrap up this story. But until then, I'm Brett. And I'm Alice. And we are The Prosecutors. Jason, I was buttering you up and I wasn't recording. <laughs> I said I really like the sound. I was listening to Casey Anthony 7 today and you make us sound so good. You really do. People That's, have commented on it. Yeah, so. no, it's like so good. We should have had a professional so doing it all so along. So much better than me. I'm so terrible. No, Brett, you, you are mean. awesome. But uh-huh. you know, you know that I was really complimenting him because I wasn't even recording at first. That's right. That's right. fruit and it's okay i just think the it's fruit okay is really look weird. i think it's legit and you know what what when hannah did the artwork did she do fruit? You know she did the artwork the fruit i mean so it there stands out man she's good hannah could probably she's solve good. all these cases by herself she probably could she probably could no doubt no doubt Saddle up and get ready for Westerns Weeks on Pluto TV, all for free. We're coming in blazing with favorites like True Grit and Once Upon a Time in Mexico. Or immerse yourself in binge-worthy series like Yellowstone and Walker, Texas Ranger. Plus, Pluto TV has hundreds of channels with thousands more movies, TV shows, and more. The best part? It's free. No credit card, no sign-up, no fees. Download the Pluto TV app on all your favorite devices and start streaming now.